Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you to our 22nd session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya and this will be our final uh, reflection on the surah as we conclude the, uh, the few remaining verses We've reached ayah number 106 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِنَّ فِي هَذَا لَبَلَاغًا لِقَوْمٍ عَابِدِينَ Truly in this is a proclamation for a worshipping people. Now, the proclamation seems to be referring to the promise, the divine promise that was made in the previous verse, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدَ الذِّكْرِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ And we have indeed written in the Psalms after the reminder that my servants shall inherit the earth. So you see, throughout this surah, Allah has mentioned the struggles and the challenges of previous prophets. And all of these conversations culminate at this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that even though some of these prophets were defeated, they were killed, their messages did not reach the far ends of the earth, they were overwhelmed by their opposition. In the end, Allah says, it is written that I have decreed that my servants will inherit the earth, meaning that they will inherit the political power, that they will be the administrators of the earth. They will have a, a godly government. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 106, He says, Inna fi hadha, truly in this is a proclamation. It's a proclamation for a worshipping people. Meaning that if you want to be a participant in the establishment of this government, a government that will be that will be established by Imam al-Mahdi, by Isa ibn Maryam. If you want to be a part of this godly movement, you have to be among the Abideen. This is a proclamation for a worshipping people. And of course there's a discussion among the scholars. Some say that Hadha in this is a proclamation. They say it's a reference to the entire surah. It's, an, it's a reference to the, the religion itself. But given the context, it seems that the, the verse means that truly in this, meaning in the promise that the righteous shall inherit the earth, this is a proclamation for a worshipping people, that the Abideen uh, are the ones who will take charge of the, uh, the political affairs of the, uh, the civilized world. Then in ayah number 107, there is an interesting shift uh, in the discussion about the Prophet and particularly the idea that he has he is a mercy to the worlds. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wama arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. And we have not sent you, meaning the Prophet, but as a mercy to the worlds. Now, what's interesting about this verse, if you look at the context, that one of the instances of the Prophet being a mercy to the worlds is that from his progeny there will be a man who will establish, fill the earth with justice as it was filled with injustice. So one aspect of the Prophet's mercy, his, his overarching mercy, which reaches future generations, is in the fact that one of his sons, the bearer of his message, will be the Messiah, the, the awaited Savior, who will usher, uh, he will usher this, usher into this, usher this period of global justice. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Now, when you look at this verse, it's interesting that if you look at the, the, the grammatical uh, uh, structure of the verse, Allah doesn't say that we sent you as a mercy to the worlds. 
You know, Allah begins by the the uh, by the word ma, which is negate. That there is the Prophet was sent solely. His only function is that he's what? He's a mercy to the world. And this is significant, brothers and sisters, because this ayah is being revealed at the end of the Meccan period. When the Prophet is a victim of persecution, he's he's been boycotted, he's being harassed, he's being vilified. And it's very easy to react to viciousness with viciousness. It's very easy to lose your cool, to, to, to become fed up. But here Allah reminds the Prophet that that you are going through a difficult time now and times will will become even more difficult you know none of the battles of islam have even begun yet so allah is reminding the prophet that these people who are opposing you these people who are fighting you these people who are planning to assassinate you who will eventually drive you out of your home homeland who will expel you from mecca don't forget that you have been sent as a mercy for all of them. Rasulullah is not just a mercy to the believers. He is not just a mercy to his followers, to his tribe. He is a mercy to the alameen. He is a mercy to, to Abu Sufyan, to Abu Lahab. He is a mercy for all of these people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to bring out the humanity in people, to make them true human beings. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالِمِ We have not sent you, but as a mercy, not to the people. You know, Allah doesn't say, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْنَاسِ That we did not send you, but as a mercy to mankind, to people. The word Al-Alameen is employed. And alameen here refers to the worlds, refers to human beings, to jinn, to angels, to creation itself. In Surah Al-Fatiha, when we glorify Allah Azza wa Jal, what do we say? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to God, who is Rabbil Alameen, who is the Lord, who is the sustainer of the worlds. Now, does Allah sustain only a part of creation or does he sustain all of creation? Allah sustains human beings, animals, plants, the stars, the sun, the angels. Every particle in the universe is part of an Alameen. So just as Allah Azza wa Jal is the Lord of the worlds, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi is a mercy to those worlds. Now the question is, how is the Prophet a mercy for all of creation? He's not, we should not restrict the Prophet's mercy to, to even just human beings. He's a mercy to the world, to the Alameen. There's a, there's a beautiful uh, narration where Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, he, he asks the Prophet, what was the first thing that Allah Azza wa Jal created? What was the first thing that God created? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, Nuru nabiyyika ya Jabir. The first entity that was created before the creation of the heavens and the earth, the first thing that was created, O Jabir, was the light of your Prophet, meaning the, the nur of the Prophet. Now, of course, nur here is not the physical light that is made of protons. It's, we're talking about uh, those higher realms. The first thing that was created was my light. And then the Prophet says, Allah, God created that light, that prophetic light. And from that prophetic light, 
Allah created all good things. Everything else emanated from that light. So essentially what we find from this narration is that the Prophet ﷺ was like the seed for creation. That everything flowed from him. And therefore, and that is how he is, that is one of the ways in which the Prophet is a mercy to the world. Because every other being received the blessing of existence through him. So he was the medium through which all other beings were created. There was, there's an interesting, uh, conversation between Imam Sadiq and one of his companions. The, uh, the Imam alayhi salam was having lunch or he was having a meal with an individual. And after the meal, the Imam alayhi salam, he says, Alhamdulillah, hadha min fadlillahi wa rasulih. Imam al-Sadiq, after finishing his meal, he says, Praise be to Allah, this, meaning this ni'mah, this food, is from the grace of Allah and his messenger. So this, this individual who was sitting with Imam al-Sadiq, I don't, I, I don't know if he was a follower of Ahlul Bayt. He was a Muslim. I don't know if he was a Shi'i or not. But he says to the Imam, Ya Aba Abdullah, which was the kunya of Imam al-Sadiq, La tushrik. Don't associate partners with God. Don't commit shirk. What do you mean? What do you mean? Alhamdulillah, hadha min fadlillahi wa rasuli. Why are you, why are you thanking God and the Prophet for the blessing of this food? You should only thank Allah. The Imam alayhi salam recited an ayah from Surah At-Tawbah, the verses, ayah number 59, Surah number 9, where Allah quotes the believers. He mentions the, the dua of the believers. And this is a type of endorsement from Allah. وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهِ سَيُؤْتِينَ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَرَسُولُهُ the believers say that God is sufficient for us. God shall grant us from His grace and the Prophet shall give us from His grace. Meaning that Allah Azza wa Jal has commissioned the Prophet to also be a distributor of His, His blessings. You know, so in the same way, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designated certain angels to govern certain parts of creation. All goodness, Allah has decreed that all goodness flows through the Prophet ﷺ. So going back to the ayah, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ There are a number of ways for us to understand this ayah. We can look at this ayah and say that this verse is is to highlight the idea that you know, guidance is the greatest mercy. And if you follow the Prophet, you will achieve happiness in this life and the hereafter. You know, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا That we ask Allah for goodness in this life and the hereafter. And the way to attain prosperity in both worlds is by emulating this Prophet. So in this way, he is a rahmah for the alim. Another way in which the Prophet is a mercy is that He's, he's a mercy, of course, he's a mercy to the believers. You know, Allah describes him, you know, uh, as, you know, بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفٌ rahim. But he's also a mercy to his opponents, to his enemies. Because the, those who opposed the Prophet, they did not experience the same kinds of destruction suffered by the tormentors of of previous prophets. So there are so many different aspects of, of mercy within the prophet. You know, the mercy of, you know, that's manifested by his guidance, the fact that we're, that even his enemies are protected from the types of punishment that, that were uh, sent down upon, uh, upon other nations. The, the, the idea that he will be an intercessor 
for the sinners, the fact that his mere presence is a safety net for the uh, for the believers, for his community. And of course, the, the, the narration that I mentioned, the idea that the prophet is the first thing that God created, and from that light, everything else was brought into existence. Verse number 108. Say, O Muhammad, it is only revealed to me that your God is one God. So will you be submitters? The previous verse mentioned that the Prophet is the declared mercy for the worlds. And immediately after mentioning that the Prophet is Rahmatan lil Alameen, Allah then mentions one of the most important aspects of this mercy. And that is what? The idea that the Prophet taught Tawheed. So here, from the context, from the flow of the verses, we find that that monotheism, that believing in one God, turning and orienting the hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the source of creation. This is one of the greatest manifestations of mercy. So because the Prophet was the teacher of monotheism, you see that immediately after mentioning that he's a mercy to the worlds, one of the most important aspects of that mercy is mentioned, and that is the fact that he is propagating the ideology of Tawheed. So there are three things that we find in this verse. So number one, the most important manifestation of the prophetic mercy that was mentioned in the previous verse is Tawheed. All goodness comes from Tawheed. Mercy can only be achieved through Tawheed. And it's not, and Tawheed is not just, you know, the idea that, that God is one. It's also the practical implications of Tawheed. So, number one, the most important manifestation of Allah's, of, of the prophetic mercy is that He was, He taught people the beauty of monotheism. That Allah is your only refuge. That He is the absolute creator. He has no partners. You will only find serenity if you turn your hearts to Him. If you turn it to anything else, it will it will result in, in misery and distress. So this is number one. Number two, the fact that the ayah says, Innama yuha ilayya. You know, the word innama is adatu haslin, meaning that it's a linguistic device that can conveys exclusivity. Meaning that if you look at all of the Prophet's teachings, they all boil down to Tawheed. Everything goes back to Tawheed. His God's, you know, the Qiyamah, the prayers, the rituals, everything that we do is, relates to Tawheed. It, the essence of it is Tawheed. And this is also important for us to internalize. That when we teach Islam, everything has to go back to the concept of Tawheed. That Tawheed is not just this elementary, you know, subject where we cover it and then we move on to something more important or more advanced. The Prophet ﷺ summarizes all of his teachings, everything that he has taught or will teach revolves around Tawheed. And then number three, why is, so if, if the greatest mercy is the fact that the Prophet taught Tawheed, he taught the deeper secrets of Tawheed, that means conversely, so what's the opposite? So if it's, if the epitome of Rahmah is to teach people Tawheed, that means that the root of their suffering is what? Is shirk. And in all of its forms, taking on 
other gods other than Allah Azza wa Jal, seeking that peace and that that happiness and that that solace, that serenity in anything other than God, is the root of all human suffering. Obeying, you know, thinking that man-made laws will will help us achieve a you know uh, an ideal society where people live in dignity thinking that man made laws are going to achieve that that's also that's also a form of shirk because only the law of allah azza wa jal with all of its intricacies can achieve that that social justice that we all yearn for because allah knows what he created and allah azza wa jal is not biased towards one group over the other so, قُلْ إِنَّمَا يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ So, after articulating and spending almost a decade teaching Tawheed, that's when the Prophet says, فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ So will you be submitters? Meaning now he puts the onus on them. Now you are responsible. I've done my job. Now, and this is important for us when we want to teach Islam to others. Are, are we teaching them adequately? Are we doing it effectively? Are we being comprehensive in the way that we teach? You know, sometimes we think that, oh, you know, I, I gave this person a little bit of advice or I handed them a book and now if they don't become Muslim, that's, you know, that's between them and Allah Azza wa Jalla. The Prophet, after spending a decade, after making the focus of his message Tawheed, and the Tawheed with all of its implications, after he does that, after he conveys the message, that's when he says, okay, now the onus is on you. Up until this point, the Prophet felt that I, that I haven't done enough, that I have to, I have to give you more. I have to teach you more. So after nearly a decade of teaching and educating and propagating, now the Prophet says, okay, now the onus is on you. فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ So will you be submitters? You know, you and I, we don't put any effort into teaching and we want to, we want, we, we, we place the onus on people. It's, you know, people are not, people are not going to find, we shouldn't blame people for not finding Islam. Have we done our part in showing them the beauty of this faith? Teaching Islam in a way that is God-centric, where everything revolves around the oneness of God? So the Prophet is essentially saying that I've fulfilled my role. I've covered the basics of the religious teachings of Islam. Now you have no excuse. Now you have to make a decision. فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ now, if they reject at this point, so the Prophet up until this point, his mission was about social justice, about you know, sp you know, speaking about the, the the oneness of God. So even the social justice was one of the implications of of that ideology. So after doing all of this, if they choose to reject, after the Prophet has comprehensively covered all of the tenets of faith, after he's invited them kindly and gently. If they reject, what happens? What is the consequence? So there's a consequence now. So up until, so if the message has not been clearly articulated, you might have an excuse. But now that the message has been, at least the belief system has been fully articulated, now there's a consequence. Allah in ayah number 109, he says, فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا But if they turn away, فَقُلْ آذَنْتُكُمْ عَلَى سَوَائِنْ وَإِنْ أَدْرِي أَقَرِيبٌ أَمْ بَعِيدٌ مَا تُوَعَدُونَ But if they turn away, so Allah is speaking now, but if they turn away, say to them, O Muhammad, I have proclaimed to you all equally. I know, I know not whether that which you are promised is near 
or fog. What does the Prophet mean? What does it mean when the Prophet is instructed to say to them that I proclaimed to you all equally? Uh, what this means is that the Prophet taught everyone and has taught everyone equally and has not kept any part of the revelation secret from anyone. So it's not that the Prophet has this inner circle that he shares with them, the teachings of Islam, and then the, the masses are totally oblivious. The Prophet is, is instructed to say what he did was he taught everyone. Everyone had equal access to Islam. And this is also an important lesson for us. You know, the hujja is against the people. Right? So the Prophet has sealed the case against his enemies because he has made Islam accessible to all of them. The rich, the poor, the free man, the slave. Males, females, elders, youngsters, all of them had access. And the reason why I say this is important for us is because we have to ask ourselves, when we build centers or institutions, are we building them in a way that makes Islam, that institution, accessible to all people? I'll give you a very simple example. I've been to many mosques. And you go there, and they have stairs, right? You know, some of them, they have stairs to get to the, uh, the entrance. There's no ramp for those who have disabilities. So you ask, you know, so you, you look at a masjid like this, beautiful masjid, they didn't spare anything. You know, they, it's beautifully designed, beautiful carpets, beautiful facility. But the one thing that they missed is what? We haven't made our masjid accessible to those who have disabilities. So can we say, if we have that type of masjid, can we say that we have made our center, a center that is supposed to teach Islam, have we made it accessible to all people? If it's a center where you have this big hall, and then a sister wants to come and listen to the Jum'ah prayer, they want to listen to a lecture, or they want to pray. Where do the women pray? Is it that the men have the huge hall and there's a small little closet space for, for the women? Is the masjid also equally accessible to our sisters, to the elders, to children? So this is an important lesson for us, brothers and sisters. You know, we might read this verse and we don't make the connection. The Prophet, Allah is telling the Prophet that you people have no excuse. Because the message was accessible to you. I have proclaimed to you all equally. Everyone had access to the message. No one can say that I didn't, I didn't hear the message of the Prophet. The Prophet was very accessible. And the Prophet did not hold back anything from the teachings of Islam that people needed for their salvation. That people needed to gain Proximity to Allah. In Surah at Taqwir, ayah number 24, we read, وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بضنين. He does not withhold grudgingly knowledge of the unseen. Rasulullah doesn't hold back knowledge of the unseen that he has that, that will benefit people, that people need in their journey to Allah. So the Prophet is very open if you want knowledge, it's available. But if, you know, it's like you build a hospital and you say that, you know, free health care for everybody. That it's, it's there for everybody. It's, it's available for every person. It's accessible to everyone. The services have been designed to, to be given to everyone. Now, if someone chooses not to go to that hospital, that's on them. The onus is on them now. I've proclaimed... I have proclaimed to you all equally. And then the Prophet says, 
I know not whether that which you are promised is near or far. Wa in adri akaribun am ba'idun ma tu'adun. The Prophet says, I don't know if what has been promised is near or far. Now, what does this mean? What is the meaning of ma tu'adu, what you are promised? So he's speaking to those who are rejecting, who are rebellious. It seems that the promise here is the promise of divine chastisement. Now, this divine chastisement, this divine punishment could be a worldly punishment, that, that punishment will descend upon them in dunya, or it could mean that it will descend upon them in the hereafter. This is the punishment of the hereafter. Or it could be both. Now, some people may read this verse and they say, Shaykh, I don't understand. On the one hand, we believe the Prophet has ilmul ghayb. He has knowledge of the unseen. You know, he, he is the one who foretold, for example, the martyrdom of Imam Amir al-Mu'minin in the month of Ramadan. He knew about what would happen to his family members. He knew about Akhir al-Zaman. You know, we have many ahadith where the Prophet, you know, with great detail, he mentions things that will happen in the end of times. So he has knowledge of the unseen. But here, the Prophet says, I don't know if the punishment will be close, meaning will come soon, or, or if it will be delayed, if it will be later. Now, <clears throat> it seems... So number one, we have to understand that there is one aspect of the unseen that is veiled from the Prophet, and in fact all creatures, and that is the knowledge of the time of the Day of Judgment. No one has that knowledge. Allah has reserved it for Himself. And this is explicitly mentioned in the Quran. If you look at Surah Al-A'raf, Surah 7, Ayah number 187, Allah says, anis sa'ati ayyana mursaha. They ask you, O oh Muhammad, they used to come to the Prophet, when is when is the day of judgment? You're talking about Qiyamah and Qiyamah and this and that. When is the day of judgment? Give us a date. Give us a time. Qul, Allah says, say to them, Innama ilmuha inda rabbi. Its knowledge is with my Lord. La yujalliha li waqtiha illa wa. He is the only one who will manifest that day. So, from the onset, we say that the Prophet, the Imams, there is no angel, no creature that knows the time of the Day of Judgment. Now, when it comes to other aspects of knowledge of the unseen, we have narrations that indicate that if the Prophet wants to know something, he can know it. It's a matter of whether he wants to know or not. Now the fact that the Prophet says, I don't know whether that which you are promised, meaning the punishment, I don't know if the punishment is near or far, it seems, and this is also a, a subtle point related to the Prophet's merciful heart. The Prophet knows that these people are going to be punished. But the Prophet doesn't care to know when and how they're going to be punished. You know, because the Prophet doesn't revel in people suffering, in people being punished. So it's not that Allah, you know, he wants to know when is it going to happen, when are they going to get punished, or how are they going to get punished. Because he's rahmatan lil alameen, when it comes to adab, he's not interested in knowing the particulars. Now, there might be certain cases where he wants to know, but generally, the Prophet doesn't revel in the knowledge of the timing and the, the ways in which, that, in, in, in which people will suffer. So, this is one possible explanation regarding why you know, the Prophet not knowing when the punishment will take place. Another explanation is that, yes, the Prophet doesn't have inherent knowledge of the unseen, but it can be given to him, right? So 
he doesn't have al ilm al ladunni. So this inherent knowledge only Allah has it. But Allah Azza wa Jal can choose to give that knowledge to his Prophet whenever he sees that it is needed or necessary. Or if there's a desire from the Prophet to know. And it's interesting that Qareeb is mentioned before Ba'id. So the ayah says, وَإِنْ أَدْرِي أَقَرِيبٌ أَمْ بَعِيدٌ مَا تُعَدُونَ I don't know if what you have been promised is near, if it's Qareeb or Ba'id. Some of the commentators, they say that this is a subtle hint that the punishment is Qareeb, that it is in fact near. Especially when we, when we consider that the, if, if we assume that the punishment is related to the Day of Judgment, you know, the Prophet is known as the Prophet of Akhirul Zaman. You know, and even the Quran says, إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَهُ بعيدا. They see it as a punishment that will happen in the distant future. وَنَرَاهُ قَرِيبًا But Allah says, I see it as something that is quickly approaching, that is very, that is very near. Ayah number 110. So inshallah, I'm hoping that we can, we can, we'll finish the, uh, the surah. So we have 112 verses, uh, three more to go, and inshallah, we will conclude our discussion. Verse number 110. Verily, he knows that which is spoken openly, and he knows that which you conceal. From this ayah, now again, going back, you know, just putting this in its context, you know, when you look at the flow of the verses, it seems that the reason why this verse is mentioned is because punishment has not yet descended upon the, the tormentors of the Prophet, his enemies. And therefore, it might seem, at least in their minds, that, you know, maybe God doesn't know what, what we're doing. Maybe, you know, our activities are undetected. You know, they, they think that oh, because we have not been punished immediately, that means that we have escaped the watchful eye of God, that we've escaped retribution. So just because you're not being punished now does not mean that Allah is unaware of your actions. And this is why the ayah says, Verily, He knows that which is spoken openly. Just to comment on you know some of the linguistic uh, points, when Allah when Allah says He knows that which is spoken openly, al jahra min al qawl is is in the nominal form. It's a noun. He knows al jahra min al qawl that which is openly spoken. Okay. And when it comes to His knowledge of what is concealed, a verb is used. So if you look at the Arabic, when he says, when the ayah says, إِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ الْجَهْرَ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ He knows that which is spoken openly, it's in the noun form, and he knows that which is, that which you conceal. Conceal is in the verbal form, in the verb form. Now why is that? Now, in the Arabic language, when a noun is used in place of a verb, instead of a verb, is to denote the idea of permanence. And, and, and that makes sense. You know, when, when something is said openly in public, it becomes public record. It becomes permanent, right? So there's, a, there's permanence when it comes to public records. But when it comes to things that are concealed, Allah uses a verb and He uses a present tense verb. Taktumun is a present tense. And the idea is that Allah knows what you do in secret as you are doing it. So it's, it's to remind us that not, it's not that, you know, people might find out about what you did in private after the fact. But Allah has full knowledge of what you conceal while you are concealing it. 
And also there's another interesting point in this verse. And that is that the word Ya'lamu is used twice. You know, when you speak, when you use a conjunction, you don't need to repeat certain verbs. So the verse grammatically would have been correct if it said, إِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ الْجَهْرَ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَمَا تَكْتُمُونَ That he knows that which is spoken and that which you can see. Grammatically, it would have been correct. But the Qur'an here makes a point to mention, to use the word يَعْلَمُ He knows twice. And that is to highlight the idea that public statements and secret thoughts are equally known to Allah. So He knows of your secret thoughts in the same way that He knows when you speak out loud. It's the exact same. It's the, it's the exact same. You know when, when, uh, when human beings want to gather information, it's easier for them to gather things that you speak in public. It's easier to make a record of your public statements, but it takes a lot more effort to gather your private communication. That's why, you know, a court needs a, they need a warrant to kind of, you know, confiscate your computer laptop or your phone. It's, it takes more effort to gather private communication. But for Allah Azza wa Jal, public statements and secret thoughts, his knowledge of them are equal. There's no added difficulty in capturing that that knowledge. And also the, the word taktumun comes from the word kitman. You know, kitman means to, to hide something. But the, you know the verb also wa'asarru also means to hide. Najwa is also a whisper which kind of denotes a sense of secrecy. Kitman specifically means to conceal something when you know that it is the truth. And like what Bani Israel did, some of the rabbis did, when they found that Muhammad is indeed the, the, the prophesied messenger in the scriptures, they concealed it. So this is a concealment that also has this element of you're concealing something that you know is true, but you conceal it because of certain personal interests. So it could be very, it could be so that the Meccans knew that what the Prophet was speaking was the truth, that he is making sense, that, you know, he, he is not saying anything that's illogical, but we are concealing our admission that, that he is truthful because we have vested interest in opposing him. Verse number 111, وَإِنْ أَدْرِي لَعَلَّهُ and I know not, perhaps it is a trial for you and an enjoyment for a while. So again, punishment has been deferred. They're not being punished now. Some of them might see this as a blessing. Oh, God is not angry with us because if he was, he would have punished us immediately. So they see the fact that they're not being punished as a sign of divine favor. But the Prophet says, perhaps this respite that you were given is a fitna, it's a test, it's a test for you, or it's to give you more enjoyment, to give you a little bit of enjoyment because you have nothing in the hereafter. Perhaps you did some good deeds and now you are, I'm giving you the rewards for it in this life. So what's mentioned here is that this is a fitna for you. You know, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people time before He punishes them. One reason could be that Allah is giving you an opportunity to repent. It's a test. Are you going to return to Allah? Or are you going to, are you going to move further away? Are you going to drift further away from God? If Allah azza wa jal knows that this person is a criminal, you know, for example, Yazid. Why did Allah Azza wa Jal allow him to live, you know, for th you know three years after Imam al Hussein? Why did why was he given that respite? Sayyidah Zainab mentions. We have even verses in the Quran 
where it, it, it mentions that Allah gives more time. Only, he only gives more time to give them more opportunity to commit evil and entrench themselves in denial of the truth. Now why does Allah do this? Allah, because Allah Azza wa Jal wants to reveal, He wants to expose what is in the hearts. And sometimes that additional time, that time that is given, is to allow them to reach their full potential, whether that is evil or whether that is good. So Allah wants to reveal the true extent of the evil of their of their souls. So so people being given time, being given money, allow being allowed to enjoy the delights of this worldly life is not an indication of divine favor. Allah in Surah at tawbah as we mentioned in our previous tafsir in ayah number 55, Allah says, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ Do not be amazed by the abundance of their wealth and their children. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنِيَ Don't be enamored, don't be taken aback by their wealth and their children and all of the blessings that we have bestowed upon them. Allah says, God desires. You know, we have innama yuridu Allah liyudhiba ankum. So this is also another innama yuridu. That Allah wills to, to reward them. Allah says, innama yuridu Allah liyu'adhibahum biha fil hayat al dunya. Allah wants to punish them through their wealth and through their children. You know, sometimes we envy people for their money and for all of the, the opportunities that they have. We think that this is such a blessing, but Allah says, no, there are some people who are so distant from me and you think that why is God giving them so much? Why did they live in such comfort? Allah says, you don't know the turmoil that's inside of them. You don't know that the things that you envy are actually the things that I'm using to punish them. I make these things the source of their misery. In Surah Al-Shu'ara, Surah 26, Ayah number 205 and two, to 207, Allah says, Do you see that sometimes we give people years? Now, these are evil people, but Allah gives them longevity. We give them years. ثُمَّ جَاءَهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يُعَدُونَ And then what was promised reaches them. Death, the punishment of the hereafter. مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يُمَتَّعُونَ What they were enjoying, their money was of no avail to them. Eventually they're going to meet their, their, uh, their destiny. Verse 112, the final ayah of Surah Al-Anbiya. قَالَ رَبِّحْكُمْ بِالْحَقِّ وَرَبُّنَا الرَّحْمَانُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ He said, now here Allah Azza wa Jal is quoting the dua of the Prophet. After all of this, this opposition, ten years of, of suffering, the ayah concludes with a dua from the Prophet. And what a beautiful du'a is. He said, meaning the Prophet said, My Lord, judge with truth. Judge between us with truth. You know, the Prophet has seen so much injustice, so much falsehood, that in this du'a there is a yearning for truth. And he recognizes that it is only Allah Azza wa Jal who can judge on the basis of absolute truth. So this is the dua that he makes. Oh Allah, you be the judge between us. They call me a liar, a sorcerer. They think that I'm misguided. They think that they're guy. You be the judge. وَرَبُّنَا الرَّحْمَانِ And then the Prophet turns to the the believers. He turns to the the, uh, the mushrikeen. وَرَبُّنَا الرَّحْمَانِ وَرَبُّنَا الرَّحْمَانِ And our Lord 
Our Lord is the compassionate. He is Ar-Rahman. And he is also Al-Musta'anu ala ma tasifun. Our Lord is the compassionate, the one whose help is sought against that which they as ascribe. What do they ascribe? The mushrikeen, what are some of the things that they said about Allah? They said, for example, that the angels are the daughters of God. And the Christians say that Jesus is the son of God. They, they accuse the Prophet ﷺ of being a sorcerer, a magician. That the Prophet ﷺ, he says that my only defense against you is Allah. And this is really the takeaway message. That we, we mentioned the struggles and the hardships of Ibrahim, of Nuh, of, of Ayyub, of, of Zakaria. All of these prophets, they faced so many difficulties. Their difficulties were different. But what's the one common denominator among all of them? They all sought the help of Allah. They faced fierce opposition. And what made them all successful, the reason why thousands of years after their deaths, we talk about them, we're inspired by them, the key to their greatness is what? Is this, this final dua of the Prophet, that they always ask Allah Azza wa Jal to be the judge. And they always sought his help. Whether they had one supporter or thousands of supporters, they always found themselves in need of Allah's help, and they always recognized the mercy of God, no matter what they were going through. They always saw Allah's Rahmaniyya. Whether it was Ibrahim who was being thrown into the fire, he recognized that Allah is merciful, he would not forget me, and Allah is the only one who can help me. When it was Nuh, there was the recognition of divine mercy, and... The fact that I'm weak, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. Our Lord is the compassionate, the one whose help is sought against that which they ascribe. With that, we end our reflection on the tafsir of Surah Al Anbiya. I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that He bestows upon us the shafa'a of all of the Anbiya, and specifically Khatam al-Anbiya, the, the final and the seal of the messengers, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, we ask Allah azza wa jal to honor us with his shafa'a and to make us among those who drink from the pool of Kawthar before we are uh, granted the honor of entering paradise with Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad If there are any questions or comments, we can take them. Could you talk a little bit about what is special about Tawheed, that it offers more peace to the hearts of uh, 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 it offers more peace to your heart than belief uh, in polytheism. So, if we de if we define the oneness of God, Tawheed, Tawheed is is not just an idea. It's not just a belief. Tawheed, according to the Quran, according to the Ahadith, is is something that is very real in the external world. So one thing that we have to understand about Tawheed is it's not just this belief that's in our minds. Tawheed is an actual, it's an observable, it's an actual phenomenon in the world. You know, everything has been created in a way where in its nature it is, it is oriented towards God. And it has to be. He, he is the source of its existence. Everything exists at every moment because Allah is supplying it with the blessing of existence. You know, it's like an electric current. You know, the reason why the light is on is because there is this constant flow of electricity. 
Allah Azza wa Jal didn't create us and then just step back and that's done. You know, some people misunderstand when Allah created the universe, the universe still is in need of Allah. So the universe needs God to come into existence and the universe also needs God to stay in it in, a, in existence. So with that said, everything in creation is moving towards him everything yearns for him everything sees itself as utterly in need of him destitute and everything is is desiring you know perfection it's desiring to fulfill its function in creation and it is allah who has inspired everything as musa alayhi salam says in the quran he describes allah as الذي أعطى كل شيء خلقه ثم هدى. God is the one who gave everything its nature, its creative properties, and then He guided it. He guided everything to fulfill its designated role in creation. So everything in creation is oriented towards Allah. It's moving towards Him, and that it's and it's moving in the right direction. It's the natural direction of creation. Now, when Allah in the Quran, when He speaks about fitrah, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينَ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهِ That the, the predisposition, the fitrah that God created in us. And this fitrah is in all people. And what is the meaning of this fitrah? This fitrah, number one, is this inborn recognition of a higher power. And we see it across all cultures. Anthropologists can even tell you that <clears throat> human beings have had different cultures, different languages, but the one thing that unites all of them, the thread that connects us to all people across all times, generations and cultures, is this reverence for the transcendent. This is part of our fitrah, recognizing this higher power. Secondly, another aspect of the fitrah is that we find this peace and this calmness when we direct our hearts to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Why? Because the most valuable thing to every human being, the most valuable thing is actually is freedom. The most valuable thing to human beings is freedom. That's why when someone commits a crime, what do we do? We, we take away their freedom. We put them in prison and we put them in a jail cell. That's Freedom is so important that if you take away people's freedom, they're willing to die for it. You know, it's even more important than life itself. So we, there's this desire to be free. We human beings have natural limitations. We're limited in our bodies. We're limited in the fact that we have needs. We have restrictions. The only thing that allows us, the only way that we experience freedom and we're able to kind of shed these limitations and these restrictions is when we connect to Allah. So we are limited beings who have this craving for freedom. You know, that's why people love flying. You know, they, people fantasize about flying because you feel free. The only way for human beings to be totally liberated from the limitations that surround their existence is to connect to the only thing that is unlimited, and that is Allah. And that's why the, the heart is at peace. Because the heart is yearning for this total freedom, this unrestricted absolute liberation. And that is only achieved when the heart is connected to the only being that is absolute. And that is Allah. Does that make sense? Uh, thank you. And could you, 
And and could you talk a little bit about the difference between Noor and Ruh, especially how it relates to the Prophet's Noor being one of the first things? The difference between Noor and Ruh. It seems that, you know, it it could be that it's it's you know, in the same way that we go through phases of existence, you know, you begin as a single cell and then you develop into flesh and bone. I don't, I don't, I don't really know off the top of my head. I don't have a clear idea of the distinction between ruh and nur. It could be that the the light is uh, is an aspect of the uh, of the ruh, but again, the ruh is not something that is murakkab, it is basir, it is it is simple. So I I don't I would have to I would have to research that. You know, the, you know when when the Quran when the, the Hadith says the first thing that Allah created was the light of the Prophet, it doesn't say the ruh of the Prophet. It says the light. So there is some distinction it seems, but it seems that the ruh came uh, came later on. It's interesting. There's a Bit of a theme in the in the surah about wealth and, pr- and prosperity not correlating to a person's favor or disfavor with Allah. It's like how of the Yub story show. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, and, 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 and wealth is not always a bad thing, right? because because Allah also gives us an example of wealthy prophets. So it's never it's never an indicator of someone's position with God. What it comes down to is, what do you do with your, what do you do with that, this ni'mah? It's, it's just like health. You can't say that because someone is sick, that means, you know, they're, they are, Allah is displeased with them. It's a ni'mah. Health is a ni'mah. Wealth is a ni'mah. It's about what you, how you, what you do with that blessing. How will you react when it is given to you? And how you react when it is taken away from you? So when blessings are taken, you have to observe patience. When they're given to you, you have to express uh, gratitude. And uh, there are a couple questions from last week which we didn't get a chance to ask. Uh, if that's okay. Sure. So uh, one question is: Will there be audits of angels and non-human objects, such as other forms of matter, in the current world that are in the current world during the day of judgment? So, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is not going to question. Uh, so the day of judgment, if you look at Surah Al-Rahman, Allah says, سنف, سنف That Allah says that I will be fadid, meaning that I will be fully dedicated to taking to you, taking you to account. I mean, who's you? Thaqalam, meaning the human beings and jinn. They are the primary addressees of the day of judgment. They will be the ones who will be audited. Now, there are some narrations that mention that animals, some animals will also be held to account. Now they're not mukallaf in the same way that, that human beings and jinn are, but they have a certain level of, uh, of taqif. So an, an animal that abused another animal may be taken to, to account. But angels, no, angels are not going to be taken to account. So human beings and jinn will be the primary uh, beings will be audited on the day of judgment. Some narrations also mention, uh, animals will also, and, and we have narrations that mention that some animals, if not all of them, will be also, uh, resurrected. You know, as we find in Surah at Taqib, when the beasts are resurrected, the beasts, some of the Mufassirin, they say this refers to, to animals, you know, they they will also, you know, uh, you know, have cases against us. You know, so if someone was abusive towards animals, the animals will also indict them on the day of judgment. And sometimes they commit acts of cruelty against each other. And Allah has His own hisab for uh, for them. But generally, it's it's human beings and jinn. Sounds like this might correlate roughly with the uh, level of free will. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And at what point will the souls, the roof, be returned to the resurrected bodies at Qiyamah? So, in Alam al-Barzakh, 
we occupy what is known as Mithali bodies. It's a type of body that is suitable for the world of Barzakh. It's very similar to the body that we have in our dreams. So your, your physical body is laying in bed. But you, when you dream, you go places, you eat, you get married, you have, you're, you're chased by thieves. What, that body is not your physical body, it's the dream-like body. So in Barzakh, we will have a Mithali body, a light body that is suitable and compatible with that world. The physical bodies that we have will be resurrected and will be joined with the the souls immediately. I mean, that, that's what brings us out of our graves. That with the with the blowing of the second trumpet, and of course, again, this is figurative language, we will uh, rise from our graves. So immediately, when the second trumpet is blown by Israfil, the physical bodies are are uh, revived and they're joined with the souls. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you who, who participated and listened and asked questions. May Allah Azza wa Jalla reward you. And uh, so I'll wait for your uh, your decision on what uh, what the next surah will be. And, uh, yeah, and, and inshallah, with your permission, maybe uh, we can do surah room next. Surah al room, inshallah. Inshallah. Wonderful. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank next. you very much, Sheikh. My salam to your family. Lots and lots of duas to Zainab and lots and lots of duas to you. May Allah protect you. Thank you so your much. Your healthy life. Amen. Under the protection of Imam Sahib al-Saman. Atala Allah ta'ala farajah al-Sharif. And may you do more and more service for the propagation of Islam. Inshallah. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.